good morning, everyone, and thank you for your interest in our work. And I'm Chiren Dai, the first year PhD student from the University of Colorado Boulder. And my research focuses on system and software security, as well as the ex expectation development. And I'm also a speaker at this year's BAHA USA. And in this project, uh, we as defenders introduce a crucial and unavoidable problem for developing an on-the-fly quarantine for the next kernel and how our protection integrates in machine learning into the kernel to address this issue. And I hope our approach will provide you some new insights about protecting the kernel. And let me introduce the team behind this work. Uh, Zicheng Wang, who received his PhD degree this year from Nanjing University, and he's the originator of the basic idea. And Tian Jinchen, the PhD student from Arizona State University, provided machine learning related assistance for this project. And Yue Qichen, the assistant professor at Seoul Boulder, specializes in the system and software security. And Huawei, the assistant professor at SU, focuses his research on reinforcement learning, data mining, and urban computing. And this presentation will be divided into five parts. And in the motivation part, I will describe the problems we face and review existing solutions and their limitations. And in the second part, I will discuss the challenges we need to overcome. And next, we will dive into the core techniques we used and describe our tools components in more detail. Then we use a video demo to show how our approach works with a CV case. And finally, I will evaluate our tool in a real world working environment. And our tool and paper are available on the GitHub and archive. So let's start uh, our first part, the motivation. So along the timeline of Linux kernel development, the life cycle of a vulnerability starts off from being introduced through some commits. And later, this vulnerability will be discovered by static analysis and dynamic fuzzing tools and then reported to developers. And developers analyze the vulnerabilities, the analogs, uh, diagnose root cause, craft and test their patches. And once the patches pass the testing and being merged into the upstream, they can be deployed in distros. So in this life cycle, there's a risk time window between vulnerability discovery and patch merging. So this time window lasts almost two months during which attackers have enough time to learn about its vulnerability and develop exploits for it. And this RSPD time window issue is not unique to the Linux kernel, but also applies to many other open source projects. So now the problem is how to remediate the newly discovered vulnerabilities in the test window before the official patches are available. And here I want to talk about a disruptive solution is not acceptable and I'll show you why. So the figure on the top right shows the number of bug reports generated by Setsbot per month. And according to the statistics, we can see that there are on average over three bugs reported per day. And on the other hand, existing sandboxing solutions are disruptive because they require rebooting to deploy. This means if we directly deploy them to have a full coverage of protection, we need to reboot the system over three times a day, which is unacceptable. Therefore, an on-the-fly solution which can be deployed at one time is desired. And luckily, some state-of-art works do provide the on-the-fly protection. Uh, one notable example is PET, uh, which is presented at Usenix Security 23. PT prevents discovered errors from being triggered in the Linux kernel. So given a bug report, it first constructs triggering conditions of this vulnerability offline. At runtime, it checks if the triggering condition is met or not. If the condition is met, it prevents triggering and thus exploitation attempts. However, this approach is limited. It prevents triggering only in the specific context manifested in the bug report. So if an attacker changes their method of triggering a bug, like uh, triggering along a different path or a different site, 
this protection may fail to function. Another work on the fly, uh, on the fly, on the fly solution named SEEK is more general. This figure on the top right illustrates a typical memory layout for heat out of bound exploitation. So by triggering the out of bound exercise introduced by the vulnerable object, attackers can read or write sensitive data in the victim objects. So with this ability, attackers can further escalate privilege. And essentially, the procedure of kernel heap exploitation is to create overlapping between the corruption caused by vulnerable object and the sensitive data in the victim object. Therefore, to thwart exploitation, SEEK isolates vulnerable objects, victim objects, in the different regions. And different types of objects are stored in separate caches. And for objects of the same type, SEEK inserts guard pages and random holes to defend the cross-cache attack. While SEEK is more general than PET, it is also limited. It can be bypassed if the attackers exploit the legacy objects. For example, if certain objects are already in the memory before SEEK deployment, they can still be targeted and abused by the attackers. And let me explain the legacy objects problem in more detail. So as you can see from the right side of the site, legacy objects are allocated before T0 when the protection is deployed and released after T0. So when the protection deployed, legacy objects are untracted, which means the protection cannot determine the type and the size of legacy objects. So what if a vulnerable object or victim object is a legacy object? These objects are not isolated differently and can be mixed with each other. It's providing uh, attackers with many chances to abuse them. And according to our statistics, over 10,000 objects have lifetime more than 10 seconds, and they are frequently used with an average of 22 modifications during their lifetime. So the main innovation of our work is to audit accesses to the legacy objects, make on the fly solution practical. So in the next part, I will introduce the technical challenges we made in auditing legacy objects and our high level solutions. So recall the legacy objects were allocated before the protection is enabled. It means we cannot place or retrieve KASN like data for these objects. So as a consequence, when a legacy object is accessed, its basic information needed for auditing, such as the start and ad address and its tab, remain untracked and thus unknown. So when we observe an exercise to these untracked objects, how do we know that this exercise is illegal or not? So let's use a real-world out-of-bound exercise to illustrate this in more detail. The C statement on the top right side uh, exercises the memory via a pointer plus offsite. And the base pointer is watch filter, type filter, and the offsite is Q type. And its corresponding instruction BTIs first ties and then sets the bits in the target memory. And in this instruction, the base pointer is uh, register R15 and the offsite is register REX. So at one time, the exercise address is R15 plus REX. And how do we know it's not exceeding the boundary? So our solution is using machine learning to help us infer the type and the exercise of the access object and match it with the ground truth. If they mismatch, which means the exercise is illegal. And as human beings, the content stored in the memory are not as biased to us. However, for machine learning models, these data are the feature of different types of objects, which can be used for inference. So to the specific example, the machine learning can tell us the type of the access object is a message message, and type message message is different from the ground truth watch filter. Therefore, an illegal memory exercise is detected.
And the second challenge is how to ensure the integrity of auditing. The Lisp kernel, machine learning model, and the Wonderbook components all share the kernel space memory by default, and they all have the highest privilege. This means Wonderbook components has the opportunity to tamper with the machine learning model's data, then bypass the protection, and compromise the entire kernel. So to solve this challenge, we audit its read and write operations launched from the vulnerable components to make sure it does not violate our security policy. For example, the kernel can read and write data in the vulnerable component, but the vulnerable component can only read from the kernel. Uh, according to our investigation, only using memory read is nearly impossible to compromise the entire kernel. So we audit subject switch to make sure a uh, malicious value from vulnerable component will not be passed to the kernel through function call or written value. And we achieve auditing uh, through kernel code instrumentation and I further create a private heat and stack to the quarantine uh, vulnerable components data from the kernel data. So in this part, I will introduce the eBPF and the machine learning technical backgrounds and then go through each component of our approach. The first eBPF is an ideal infrastructure to implement the kernel on the fly quarantine. It works like at a sandbox virtual machine the kernel. Its feature enables developers to extend the functionality of the kernel without modifying kernel code or loading extra modules. eBPF is an ecosystem that this kernel has the ability to hook instructions kernel events, syscalls, and network packet. It's verifier use static and dynamic analysis to guarantee EPPI programs will not break, the, break through the sandbox. And the just-in-time compiler converts, uh, converts the EPPI instructions to machine code, improving the runtime efficiency. And EPPI maps provides like hash map, array, ring buffer, and other data structures usage and its helper functions can interact with other kernel subsystems, help eBPF call some kernel functions, or read and write kernel data. And we compare the three modules which are potential to be suitable for our task, the decision tree, random forest, and deep learning. The decision tree is used for both classification and regression tasks. The goal is to create a module that predicts the value of a target variable by learning simple decision rules inferred from the data features. And the random forest is an example of decision trees designed to improve the robustness and accuracy of predictions and anti-overfeeding. So for deep learning, the model is more complex than the two mentioned modules. It uses artificial neural networks to perform sophisticated computations on large amounts of data. And the structure includes many layers. And the training process includes the input data and the forward, forward publication, the loss calculation, and the backward publication, iteration, and so on. It has a powerful ability of learning and extracting features from complex data. And this figure shows the overview of our approach. T0 represents the dividing point between the preparation work and the completion of the deployment. So first, the component is object profiler. It uses its own eBPF program to collect object data for machine learning model training and gathers tag and other information for later auditing. And the machine learning model is trained based on data collected by the object profiler offline, then provides the module for the eBPF's program's inference. The code analyzer analyzes the kernel binary and a source code to identify instruction entries for instrumentation. And eBPF programs, it is responsible for code instrumentation, type inference, vulnerable component quarantine. So after these steps, uh, our tool su is successfully deployed, effectively constraining the vulnerable parts from compromising the whole kernel. So let's enter the first component, 
the object profiler. The goal of the object profiler is to collect and filter data for later machine, machine learning model training. So how to retrieve data? We use an EBP program running in the kernel to hook object allocation and its release size. So at the allocation site, the stack trees of the allocation and the address of the object are fetched and stored into the eBPF maps. And then we use that color, a fasting tool, to diverse execution context and enrich our data source. And what content and when should we collect the data is essential to the accuracy of the machine learning model. As mentioned earlier, an object may be referenced many times during its life cycle, so we collect each object's data for training at its release site because this is it when uh, it possesses the most features that best, best reflect its characteristics. So for example, most objects are initialized with zero at first, but just before its release site, they may contain unique values, the memory layouts, and other features can help us to distinguish them from other projects, other objects. <coughs> and we use the object data content as the feature and its type and the whether it belongs to the kernel as the label. So for the machine learning model, we choose the decision tree model for the following reasons. So first, the decision trees performs uh, better on the table data compared to the deep learning modules. And they are interpretable. <coughs> And once the model is trained, it has a fixed depth. This ensures that the execution time will not exceed a fixed value, which is crucial for the disk kernel's runtime efficiency. And since we are using uh, integers, uh, integers as features, the decision tree model can run down its threshold, maintaining the quantitative accuracy. Compared with the random forest, the decision tree model can be relatively easy to be converted to a BPF implementation. And the color analyzer component is responsible for identifying which instruction should be instrumented. And the procedure on the top right shows, so first we use an open source binary analyzer tool called Ghidra to analyze the disk kernel binary file via Linux. And our rules are shown on the left. It specifies instruction types like the indirect jump, indirect call, memory write, and subject switch. <coughs> so considering the performance impact is tied to the number of uh, instru instrumented instructions, so we have done the following optimization. We skip read instructions, determining address, and redundant check. Determining address is easy to understand as the attackers cannot control the address they want to write. So the instruction type is useless to them. And the redundant check means if there are many memory access instructions use the same base pointer, usually it is an, a re-access or multi-fuse access in a structure. So we consolidate multi, multiple exercise checks into a single check, which means the eBPF programs examines the minimum and the maximum of size, representing the two extremities. And this optimization methods helped us to reduce the instrumentation entries by 24%. And the EBP program component plays the most crucial role in our entire approach. In addition to handling all the instrumentation checks, we added extra hyperfunctions to implement the quarantine mechanism. These functions provide the capabilities such as setting registers and maintaining private data structures like private heap and stack. And uh, they are for the quarantine zone and which are not available in the default EBP, eBPF helper functions. And to improve the interaction with data structures stored in the eBPF maps, we also designed the corresponding helper functions for quarantine data maintenance. And this allows for more efficient and secure management of quarantine data. So after knowing the specific techniques of our implementation, 
I will use the CVE 2022-0995 as an example to demonstrate how our approach effectively stops the exploits. So let's start with a simple figure illustrating the root cause and the impact of this vulnerability. This vulnerability exists in the Linux watch queue subsystem and in the function watch queue set filter. So by crafting a malicious value, an attacker can control a write range from 0 to hex 80 bytes, which can be larger than the watch filter size, hex 60 bytes, leading to a typical out-of-bound write. And heap function for the exploit is shown in the figure. The attacker first breaks uh, many primary and secondary message, message structures, and then allocates the vulnerable watch filter object among them. So the out-of-bound write can then make the next pointer in the message, message struct large enough to point to another secondary message, resulting in a message message used up for free. So in this example, a simple outbound write could lead to a UAF and further exploit ability escalation. Our approach can prevent it when the outbound write happens at the very beginning. Let's see more details. So first, the program counter is in the quarantine zone and is trying to access the legacy objects outside the private heap. So if we thought the machine model, the address region, and the type of these objects will be unknown to the protection. But with our machine learning model, when the out of bound write exercise occurs, with the address exceeding the end address of the watch filter and locating in the untracking memory, the machine learning model helps infer the type of object as message message, which belongs to the kernel. So according to our policy, EVPF program's instrumented instruction should exercise watch filter by the code analyzer and object provider. But uh, the message message is different from watch filter. So this indicating an error. And let me use two short videos to show how our tools work. So the first video shows exploit without our protection, and the second one shows the exploit stopped by our protection. I ported this vulnerability to the Linux kernel version, uh, which our tool runs on. So then the exploit runs until gets overlapping between two second message message by auto bound write. And in this demo, the primary message with the ID 8174 also points to the secondary message 8179. It's to two reference to the 8179 and further use the R for free. And we are still in the same environment and run exploits. So this time I launch our tool before the out-of-bound write happens to simulate the scenario, the victim objects and the vulnerable objects are as legacy objects and they are out of the private heap and mixed with each other in the untracking memory. So then we can see the exploit fails to create overlapping and our tool printed the access object address. And here comes the final part of the presentation, the evaluation of the machine model's accuracy and the performance of our tool in a practical environment. And we use LMBench as the microbenchmark and use Phoronix test use to test common applications as a macro benchmark. And we can see the overhead is negligible no matter whether the machine, machine learning auditing is enabled or not. And to compare with the, compared to the state of our work, HAKC, uh, which is a sandbox solution, AutoQ also, uh, also quarantined the IPv6 module and tested the impact of Apache Bench IPv6 file transfer on the performance of the quarantine component. And uh, from the left to the right, each legend means uh, we quarantine a single file and we quarantine with machine learning and we quarantine a module, a quarantine module with machine learning. 
And the final part is deployed HAKC. So in comparison, the HAKC uh, represented by the green color showed less overhead for large fails. Uh, this is because the HAKC leverages hardware features to reduce inspection overhead when many memory access are in the same region. Now, however, HKC cannot be deployed in real time, which is the primary goal of our work. And as mentioned before, there are two levels of granularity of our training objectives. Uh, the first one is fine grain, the specific type of the data object, and the coarse grain, where the current data object belongs to the current zone or kernel. And the coarse grain, where the current data object belongs to the current zone, shows the high accuracy. And both decent tree and random forest modules achieve relatively high accuracy, but the decent tree model is more suitable for implementation via BPF. So therefore, we ultimately choose the coarse grain decent tree. And here are the details of the parameter tuning for the decision tree. With the feature length of 64, we achieve good results, and the optimal performance is observed at a maximum depth of 14. So using the decision tree, we further fine tune its hyper parameters. And here's our takeaway. Uh, our work will review the legacy object problem, which is critical to the production kernel on the fly before patches are available. And we demonstrate how embedding machine learning into kernel can effectively resolve the legacy object problem. And our limitation is machine model accuracy is not 100%. Our approach can only suffice as a temporal remediation before patches are available. So for our future work is to mature the prototype implementation and solution to the current cases in the machine learning model. And we are expecting collaboration and reduce overhead using GLS and other features. Uh, so thank you for your attention and interest in our work today, and I'm honored to be here to uh, hope you enjoyed it. So if you have any questions or feedback, I'm really happy to hear them from the social media. Thank you.